Hi there, my name is Ron Rogers, and this video is titled My Perspective on Officer Enlisted Relations. Now, I grew up in a middle class family. My dad was a firefighter, and we were not poor, but we were not rich. Uh, I wasn't one of the wealthy kids. I had a lot of friends who kids were, you know, their parents made money. Uh, they were doctors, stuff like that. Being a, a firefighter back then, they actually called them firemen because it was totally male dominated <laughs> uh, business back then. But um, firefighters weren't respected to the degree they are now after, you know, 9-11 events and things like that. They were back then. It was just kind of a more of a middle class uh, menial job, if you were. So I wasn't used to having any great status. And of course, when you go into the Air Force, if you're a pilot back then in the 70s, you became an officer. All right. Kind of a, a new experience for me. Uh, both my father and my wife's father were in World War II. My dad was a private and so was my wife's father. Now, interestingly enough, my wife's brother was enlisted in the Navy. But OK, I'm in the Air Force. He's in the Navy. That wasn't an issue for me. And I don't think it was an issue for him. Never really mentioned it, but, um, uh, you know, so I have a lot of background there, but I was the first officer, if you will, in the family. Now I feel you should treat everybody with respect. Everybody is an individual of worth and everybody has a story to tell. So I was not in the mood of, uh, lording anything over anybody. I know there are people who, who uh, savor those positions, but I was just fine kind of being one of the guys and going along. Now, there was a, there was a lot of respect, of course, I had for the, the people above me. And, and most of those, of course, were in a training environment, were pilots. And the more senior you are um, as a, a pilot, generally, the more experience you have. So uh, as the command structure went up, the people were generally more impressive. And, and at this time, Many people were coming back from Vietnam, and there were uh, captains with absolute chest full of medals and have done amazing things. And of course, I'm a second lieutenant. That's kind of the uh, uh, the officer in training, I guess, if you will. And it was quite interesting. Now, of course, there was a need for discipline, and the higher ups made sure that discipline was maintained. And one of the things uh, was that if you were walking around base and you saw the wing commander's car, you saluted it. And if you didn't salute it, you could get into trouble. And another thing was whenever the wing commander came into the squadron building, the squadron was called to attention. And we had had an issue where the uh, wing commander got fairly far into the squadron. The squadron had not been called to attention. And of course, um, that didn't go over well. So. I'm standing in the restroom in front of the urinal and the wing commander comes in next to me and he, he says, hello. And, you know, pulls up the, urinal. I had not heard the squadron called to attention. So, Hey, <laughs> even though I'm in the bathroom, I started to take a real deep breath to uh belt out squadron, you know, attention and all that stuff. And he says, no, no, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Now, after I completed pilot training, got my wings, one of the first things they do is they send you to survival school. And we were up at Fairchild in Spokane, Washington, and it's fairly um, an intense program. And we had a weekend off. And a friend of mine who was going to C-130s, I was going to be a T-37 instructor, had some time off and, of course, no transportation of any sort. We were in the barracks, but we wanted to go into town. And we weren't quite sure, you know, how to do it. So we sauntered out to the guard shack. You know, we were just had time on the weekend. We we're going to have some fun. And we started talking to the, uh, um, uh, airmen out there in the guard shack, a very nice young little lady. And we're just having a nice little conversation and stuff like this and going on. And, uh, so she finally says, so what do you guys do? And I go, well, we're both pilots. And she looked at us and she says, what? And I said, yeah, I'm a T-30. I'll be a T-37 instructor and he'll be flying C-130s. And she looked at us and said, your officers? And I go, well, we're second lieutenants. <laughs> I mean, that's just barely an officer. And of course, that put a total chill over the conversation because, um, you know, they're told not to fraternize with officers and things like that. So uh, what had been a nice, friendly little chat when nothing really had changed 
unfortunately took a chill and uh that was kind of our key to leave and uh, uh we were able to hitchhike into town which is interesting you wouldn't believe the graffitis on the signs next to the roads that you pass at 55 miles per hour comments like uh, hitchhikers that died at this post i mean they were just covered with graffiti but i digress now i'm going to be an instructor pilot so they send us down to randolph air force base in san antonio texas which is a lovely base and a lovely city and randolph air force base opened in 1931 and of course it started out as a uh, army air corps base uh, there are pictures of biplanes out there in the, in the same general area where we were operating uh, T-37s and T-38. So it has a, has a lot of history there. And of course, when the Air Force came into existence, it became an Air Force base. Now, the base is beautiful and it's, it's uh, built with what's known as Spanish colonial revival style of architecture. This is in the center of the uh, base, as it were. And this is building 100, which was headquarters for the uh, wing training command there. And it was surrounded um, in kind of rank order with uh, the highest uh, people on base, uh, a general, if there was one, and uh, full bird colonels. And, and as you got farther out, uh, the rank went down. And we were briefed that um, you were not to be rowdy in this area because one of the interesting things was we had an officer's club there. And in the officer's club, we had a bar called the Auger Inn. And the Auger Inn was frequented by pilots and um, a lot of women trying to pick up pilots, apparently. Now, I lived out on uh, the local community since, uh, you know, just outside the base there, since we were there just temporarily. So uh, we were rented a little apartment for uh, three months. They had a, a short-term rental set up. And one of my neighbors was a simulator instructor in the T-37. And... Uh, he and I uh, became friends. The wife became friends and, and we had a lot of fun together. We went out to dinner and stuff like that. Of course, he's enlisted and I'm an officer, but you know, we're in civilian duty and it's, uh, you know, no big deal. But he always mentioned he kind of wanted to go and see the Auger Inn. He had heard so much about it. And I said, well, come on along. And he goes, oh, it's an officer's club. And I go, I can bring a guest. I mean, we're in civilian clothes. Nobody knows who you are. Uh, of course, that was a slight mistake because he was a T-37 instructor, um, and so a number of the pilots did come across him. Well, we go down the Auger Inn, we're having a fun time, we're drinking a few beers, we're talking, and some guy comes up to him and says, you look familiar. And I could see the <laughs> kind of terror in his eyes because he was being found out. So I just said to the guy, did you fly the 105 in Nam?" And he says, no, I didn't. And he says, well, that must not have been it. And uh, my friend uh, uh, made a sigh of relief, and then uh, we left there shortly thereafter so nobody else uh, would uh, would recognize us. But I did my training command tour, and I went out to, uh, afterwards, I went out to uh, the flight test center at Edwards. Now, the crew chiefs on Vance were civilian contractors, and uh, that was kind of an unusual and fun experience because a lot of them uh, were very nice young ladies who wore uh, halter tops and uh, were very pleasing on the eyes. In fact, we had one individual, a major, who we ended up not liking at all because he put in a safety comment that uh, these girls in their outfits were distracting. So they um, tended to wear t-shirts, and I won't go into all that, but um, I won't say it was an improvement. Um, people always know how to get even with you. But I always considered crew chiefs, even though they were enlisted, I consider them equals because they would save your posterior. And if you were to lord it over of them, uh, that's not something you want to do. These guys had your back. They, they, uh, you know, they technically couldn't be your buddies, but we had a strong relationship and it, it was a, it was a good thing. Um, because we worked closely together and we had a lot of fun. Now, as I mentioned, I worked in the command post and one of the enlisted people, it was always an officer and an enlisted person working on the desk. The officer wasn't in charge and the enlisted person assisted him. Well, uh, 
quite often I would have Chief McKelpin, who was a Chief Master Sergeant, the ranking NCO on the base. This guy had more stripes than God, and he was just an amazing individual to work with. His, his talent was you could name any location, and he would tell you the three-letter identifier for that, you know, military base, things like that, all over the world. I couldn't stump him. Uh, and he was a great guy. And he and General Stafford, the uh, center commander, would go out for lunch. I never got invited out for lunch with the general, but he would because he was the, <laughs> the senior ranking guy. And he was just an absolute uh, pleasure to work with. And uh, this is back in the 70s, and he told me about all the good old days in the Air Force. Now, we had a sergeant, and I'll call him Sergeant R., and Sergeant R was a bit of a screw up. And, and the way we operated was we would be sitting back at the desk, which had a big phone bank, hotlines everywhere. And uh, the sergeants would be up at the grease board, keeping track of the flights, uh, what the flights were, who was on them, takeoff landing time, things like that. That's how we kept track of things. And um, I mentioned before that um, on one of the other videos that uh, I came into this position and the two people that preceded me were both majors and were both fired. But of course, being a 20 year old, I had absolutely no concept of failure. Uh, you know, the, uh, um, youth, the, uh, the disillusionment of youth, but, uh, Sergeant R was up there and, and Sergeant R actually got, uh, uh, fired kind of out from under me. Um, there was a Lockheed test flight, an L-1011, and they had a critical fuel load. They were coming off of Palmdale, just south of Edwards, uh, in Lancaster there, and they were coming into the test area, and they were going to do a test mission on performance and handling qualities. Well, the, the test points were very um, fuel critical, and uh, they were turned down entry. Now, we had we had a sheet of paper, and on it were ops entry numbers. And if you had a scheduled test mission, you had an ops entry number. And apparently they were refused. And I uh, got a call. The phone started ringing and they said, you refused our aircraft into the uh, test area, but we were on the schedule. And I go, what's the test? And I looked it up and I go, yeah, you're here right in the schedule. I said, who refused you? And they said, the command post. And I said, this is the command post. And I turned to Sergeant R and I said, did you refuse Lockheed test in here? I, he said, I sure as heck did. They're not on the schedule. And I pointed there and he goes, oh. And I said, okay, can you turn them around? Can you get them back in? And they said, no, it's cruel, fuel critical. They're going to have to land and refuel. And I said, I'll tell you what, whenever you get it fueled, you get it ready. Whenever you're ready, I'll clear you back in here. Don't worry about it. We'll take care of this. And they said, thank you very much. And, um, I uh, went out of the room down the uh, hall a uh, few feet to the wing commander's office and I briefed him on the situation and, um, uh, you know, I had to brief him on the situation because it was, it was an event that occurred and it, it affected us being an outside contractor and, and, uh, relations with the base and things like that. So I, I had to, uh, I had to bring it to their attention. Well, uh, Sergeant R got, uh, fired, uh, a while later, but before this happened, he had been selected into officer candidate school. He was going to become a second lieutenant. So I'm sitting there with Chief uh, Master Sergeant McAlpin, and I said, you know, Chief, uh, Sergeant R up there, in a few months he's going to be an officer, and you'll have to salute him. <laughs> and Chief slammed his fist down on the table and said, it'll be a cold day, and you can probably guess what, before I salute that little, yeah, okay. This is a family video, so I can't go into all the language that was used, but uh, Sergeant R was up there and you could just see him cringe. And it was funny. Anyway, that's my perspective on a few of the items on officer and enlisted relations. Thanks for watching.